Hello, everybody. This is Tiffany with The Private Room. And tonight, we are going to be talking to um, several survivors of domestic violence. Um, as you can see, we have a lot of people on tonight who are willing to share their stories with you. Um, this month is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. It's October, and even though all year round we should be fighting for this cause to reduce domestic violence and DV-related home homicides, tonight we are talking to some of our survivors because it is Domestic Violence Awareness Month as well as Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and this is the time that a lot of people are willing and able to share their stories when they might not be ready to share it throughout the year. So I'm very, very thankful for those who are on tonight that are willing to share, that are gonna be um, telling you about how, you know, basically what their story is, how was it for them being in domestic violence um, uh, relationship, how they got out of those relationships. And then we're gonna talk about what you can do as survivors or maybe if you are currently in a really bad relationship or an abusive relationship, what you can do to get out of those out of those relationships and what you can do to help us um, with reducing domestic violence in your community and in your homes. So tonight we have a number of survivors on here with us tonight. But first I want to start with our normal cast on the private room, which is uh, Tiffany Knowlton. Tiffany, can you raise your hand or shake your hand? There she is. Tiffany Knowlton. We have Ropey Hill as well, who is also on the regular private room cast. And then we have Mr. Barry Scarborough. Thank you for y'all for joining. Um, I know that all of us are survivors ourselves, which of course, I didn't plan it like that. I didn't plan the private room to have domestic violence survivors on it, but we do. And so I'm really, really happy that not only are they willing to be on our regular episodes on Monday night at eight, but that they decided that they wanted to share their stories as well. So they're going to be sharing their stories. And then we also have Miss Davina Stevens with us, Miss uh, Coach Lee with us. And then we also have Nikki Brooks and our returning guest, C. Dwayne Hennett, as well as our new guest, Miss Brittany Bell. So we have a lot of new faces on tonight, but we're going to get started right now. I know we're a few minutes um, behind getting in. And so I wanted to make sure that we get right to it because I want to make sure that everybody's story is heard and that you are able to ask any questions. So if you are watching live on our Facebook page at the Private Room with Tiffany, then please go into the comments for you to join us and ask any questions that you have, share any comments that you have. I will be watching watching to be able to see what your comments and questions are so that we can ask those that are on our panel tonight. So we're going to jump right in. Um, as y'all know, and from being on the private room, which was formerly the Speak Up and Inspire series, you know that I am a domestic violence survivor myself. Um, I have been in multiple, unfortunately, multiple domestic violence relationships, and that was due to me not healing from my trauma and not addressing my trauma and, and addressing my past. Um, thankfully, I was able to turn that around with counseling and therapy. So I definitely recommend everybody out there, if you are a victim and you are currently in a domestic violence relationship or domestic violence situation, please listen to the stories tonight because I guarantee you that you're gonna hear some things that are gonna resonate with you, but then also might be helpful to you as well. We wanna make sure that you're safe. So if you are in a place where um, your abuser might be able to hear you or access or you know, access you in any type of way, whether they're in the next room, whether they are on their way home, please make sure that you are safe first and foremost. Um, if you are in a safe environment, please, please, please listen. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to any of the um, normal cast members, myself, Tiffany, Ropey, or Barry. Um, but you can also feel free to reach out to any of the other panelists as well, whoever you feel comfortable with talking to. We, but First and foremost, we wanna make sure that you are safe. Um, if you are a current survivor and you are interested in sharing your story, there will be other opportunities for you to do so. Um, and so we want for you to reach out to us if you want to share your story as well on a future, um, on a future episode. There will be plenty of opportunities for you to be able to do so. So I want to go ahead and get started. And we're going to start, of course, with our, um, our current cast members. And that is going to be 
I sent out the I sent out the lineup and didn't even look at it myself, y'all. Sorry. So <laughs> um, the first person that is going to be sharing tonight is I want to make sure that I introduce Mr. C. Dwayne Hennett. So Mr. C. Dwayne Hennett is a, an advocate. He is also an author. He's an author of The Ripple Effect. Um, I have him on tonight. So even though he is not a survivor himself, he has written a book that helps other advocates, other victims, and other survivors with just learning more about domestic violence, um, kind of seeing what that looks like, um, what to look for in an abuser, but also to look um, out for ways for you to be helpful to someone that might be your neighbor, your sister, your 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 friend, your bestie, whatever that is. So if you have not read his book, The Ripple Effect, please make sure that you go and, um, and get a copy. I highly recommend it for those that are victims, are survivors, or new advocates, because it really, really gives you in plain, simple terms what domestic violence is, and it really goes in depth as to what to look for, um, the background of domestic violence. It has some statistics in there. It also gives you characteristics of, of an abuser. And so we're going to start with him, and he's going to kind of um, join me throughout the episode tonight to talk about some points that that our survivors are gonna share with you tonight. So Mr. Duane, can you please um, introduce yourself and tell everybody more about the work that you do in the community? Hello everyone, C. Duane Hanna, author of The Ripple Effect, The Lasting Effects of Domestic Violence. I am a domestic violence advocate. Um, I also advocate for um, mental illness, homelessness, and human trafficking. Um, I'm an independent advocate. I work with any and everybody who um, wants to. So if you guys are doing any projects or need somebody to speak, I'm always there. I'm always a listening ear. Um, I do also help advocates get, get resources as well. Thank you so much. So I think it's really important for people to know how you got into this. So can you share how you became an advocate? Um, I became an advocate. My story is that I've been married four times and each time that I've been married, um, uh, my uh, exes have been um, survivors of domestic violence. Um, it's not that I sought them out. Um, it was just that it was a very common um, thing. Um, a lot of the people that I had um, dated had been through domestic violence. Um, I was also uh, working for the city of Durham. They had a domestic violence task force that I was also a part of. And the night that we were doing an annual conference, I had a friend go through a domestic violence situation the night before. Wow, um, thank you. So you've been on um, a few times to talk about domestic violence. Um, and I always like to have you on um, the podcast when we do talk about domestic violence, because I think it's really, really important for men to be a part of this fight and to be advocates for, for well, against domestic violence. And the reason why is because we always see domestic violence victims as females. And we know that men can be victims of domestic violence as well. Can you share your experience with um, working with men that are domestic violence survivors and how that experience has been for you? Yes, um, so me working with men, um, has, it, it, it was difficult. And if you read my book, my book is very geared towards um, women and men being the abuser, abuser or the aggressor, only because the data wasn't there at the time that I, I wrote it. So there wasn't a lot of men that was out there talking. But as I advocated more and became more active in the community, I started to hear more stories and uh, hear from men that were being abused or that were in domestic violence um, relation, uh, situations. Um, I had one guy who, um, who came to me exclusively for help, who was going through a divorce, and his, his wife was trying to take his kid from him, had actually stabbed him and had actually stabbed him. Um, before and she was doing all these other things to make him try to lose his job. Um, that's just one of one of many that I've actually you know heard from, and you know as an example as far as men going through domestic violence. 
Yes, thank you. Um, we just had the King's Table on, which you are one of our normal or regular panelists for the King's Table. And we talked to um, a couple of men on there who are advocates against domestic violence. And one of those um, advocates is on with us today, Mr. Barry Scarborough. Um, he did share with us that he was once a victim of domestic violence himself, um, and he shared his story. So I want to say thank you to Barry for sharing your story, because as men, we know that some of the reasons why they don't report being um, um, victims is because of fear of stigmatism, fear of being seen as weak, um, and just the, the backlash that men get when they report that they too are victims of domestic violence. So um, quickly before we talk to our other um, panelists on tonight, um, can you just give kind of a description of what an abuser, what kind of characteristics an abuser um, will display to it? you know, to people, because um, I think it's really important for us to know that there are some common characteristics to abusers. Uh, some characteristics uh, that you look for, first of all, is that they're a narcissist. Um, they don't take accountability for any anything that they've done. Um, they play the blame game. Um, they're, they're never accountable for their actions or what their actions have led to. Um, there's a lot of manipulation that goes into it. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, self self hatred um, that that you may find too. Uh, you may also find some generational curses um, that are within their family that you may see. You may see somebody who has impulse problems, anger problems as well. Yes. Um, for those that are on, I see some heads shaking. Do y'all agree with that? Do y'all agree that's a, that the, that's a lot of the characteristics that you saw in your abusers? Yeah. Um, I know the term narcissist or narcissism is thrown around a lot. Sometimes people throw that around because they just feel like their spouse is just this horrible person and they don't want to take accountability for their part in the relationship. So that term is 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 thrown around a lot. However, it, it has been shown that people that are abusers, the facts have shown that people that are abusers um, do not take responsibility for their actions. Um, they do uh, do a lot of gaslighting and blame on the victim. It's always the victim's fault for why they hit them, why they cuss them out, why they why they uh, manipulate them. Um, and there's always that, 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 view of being better than everybody else, especially their victim or the person that they're abusing. So um, narcissistic or narcissistic characteristics and narcissism is definitely a characteristic of abusers. And so I really want to tell people to educate themselves about what narcissists and narcissism is, because that term is used pretty loosely um, from mad spouses that aren't even in abusive relationships. Um, I've seen it from groups that I'm in that is about narcissistic spouses. And I'm just, I look in those groups a lot and I'm just like, that's not narcissism. That's just you not being accountable for your part. So I've seen that a lot. Um, and, uh, so I really encourage people to, educate themselves about domestic violence and educate themselves about characteristics of an abuser. And I also <clears throat> encourage people to really uh, educate themselves about the terms that they use because it's, it's not fair to label someone as a narcissist when indeed they're not a narcissist um, because that's a very serious term um, and it can have um, lasting effects if you put it out there and that person is not that, it can affect their lives because it's a term that is seen as a negative characteristic, as a negative term and something that you just don't play with. And it's not something you just throw out there because you're mad at somebody <laughs> and you're not getting your way. <laughs> so um, I always tell people to educate themselves. I know Tiffany, who is my assistant director for the private room, her and I talk a lot about educating yourself about terms and what you call people and what you label people as. And that is one of those terms that you really, really should educate yourself about um, before um, putting that label on somebody. Really know what it is that you're talking about and knowing what those definitions are before you um, classify people. So I also want to ask, Dwayne, what are some characteristics of a victim? What are some things that you commonly may see in a victim? 
Um, and I'll add to your list if you don't say them already. <laughs> So some common characteristics that I see is uh, PTSD, um, someone who hasn't healed from their trauma. Um, another characteristic that I see is bad relationships. Um, they have a, a toxic relationship, what I wrote in my book, a toxic relationship poison all other relationships. So if they have bad relationships with their uh, um, spouse or their, their intimate partner, they usually have bad relationships with anybody else too as well. Um, it could be a parent, it could be a child, it could be a sibling. Um, those are those are generally the characteristics of someone who's been through domestic violence. Uh, or you may see someone who, let me see, what else can I say? That, let me see. Someone else who is, dates a lot um, and keep choosing the same person, just in a different body. Yeah. 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 I definitely uh, um, agree with those. Um, and I can say just from um, oh, wow. my work, my work in the community and just, you know, meeting other uh, victims and when they're in that so moment bad. of being in abusive relationships um, is that they have, they tend to have low self-esteem and that's not something that I'm saying is for everyone on here, but I have noticed that those that are victims of domestic violence usually have low self-esteem. Now, that, that doesn't mean that they had low self-esteem when they went into the relationship. So they might have had a great self-esteem, but being in an abusive relationship, they, they developed a low sense of self and a low sense of self-image. And so usually by the time they are in an abusive relationship, they have low self-esteem and a low sense of self. self. Um, so that's another common characteristic that I have seen just in my work in the community and just, you know, um, you know, working with families who are dealing with domestic violence. And then the children, on top of it, I see a lot that they can, they tend to be aggressive um, they will fight you <laughs> over the littlest things. They're very, very protective of their parents. You can't say nothing about their mama. That's a normal child. But when it, it can be just the littlest things and they just, they they go from zero to a hundred very quickly. Um, having, they call daddy issues or mommy issues where they're looking for the perfect mom or dad and other people. And so they start dating other people who represent what they see at home. Um, and then our children start getting into abusive relationships, are really bad, unhealthy relationships because that's all they know. Um, so those are some characteristics that unfortunately our children go through. I've seen it in my children as well. Um, you know, just witnessing um, verbal and mental abuse themselves, you know, from, and I won't say any names, but they, I've seen those things in, you know, in my children as well. And so I have them in counseling as well as myself to make sure that they are addressing those things that they've seen and witnessed and just to help them continue to be advocates for themselves. Um, I was very, very proud of my daughter for speaking up about a week ago um, on something where she felt like someone was being abusive to her. And that's because I've taught her what abuse is. And so it's really important that we teach our children as well what domestic violence is or intimate partner violence. Um, because children are dealing with that too. Even if they live in a healthy home, they have a boy that they just are madly in love with who treats them like crap. And they don't know that, or they don't know how to get out of it once they realize that it's unhealthy. It's very hard for them to get out of it because they're children. I don't care how grown they act, they're still children and their minds are not fully developed to be able to know how to advocate for themselves sometimes and sometimes to get out of those relationships. So it's really, really important that we educate our children as well and to know the signs of domestic violence in our children's homes, um, especially if we're educators, therapists and so forth. Um, so thank you, uh, Dwayne. Again, I will be kind of bringing you into the conversation throughout, but I really, really appreciate you um, lending your expertise with us tonight, as you always do. Whenever I call you, you're always like, yep, I'm there. So I know that you advocate against uh, human trafficking as well. So I'll be calling you on that for that episode. <laughs> that we're going to be doing. Tiffany um, is had asked if we can do a human trafficking episode, I believe in January. Yep, in January. So I'll let you know the date for that so that you can join us for that as well. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dwayne. I really appreciate you. So um, I want to go ahead and introduce our first 
um, story and our first survivor, and that is going to be Miss uh, Tiffany Knowlton, who I said earlier is our my assistant director for the private room. So, Miss Tiffany, um, the floor is yours. Please share your story. Um, tell us about you, how you got out of your relationship, and then we'll kind of go from there. Alrighty. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Tiffany. Um, I think my story is going to be a little bit unique because um, my aggressor was my partner, which was a woman at the time. Um, it was my first lesbian relationship and it lasted eight long, horrendous years. Um, at first, it seemed, everything seemed fine. Um, I was very much love bombed in the beginning. And um, I can remember the very first um, issue that happened was when she was drunk. And she, apparently she felt that I was talking to a guy on the phone, but really I was talking to my cousin who was a female and she just lost it. Um, I can remember she pulled a chunk of hair out of my head, uh, which has never grown back. <laughs> um, she, she did punch me in the face. Um, my son ended up getting his lip busted open from the phone because he was trying to protect me. Um, and I had the phone in my hand and he, well, she was trying to grab the phone away from me and I just let it go. And me and my son both went backwards and somehow he ended up getting hit in the lip with the phone. Um, another occasion, she bit me in my face, on my cheek in both sides and threw my keys in the middle of the street at night in front of my kids again. Um, another time, I've had numerous concussions from her, um, black eyes, you name it. Um, something that I'm not proud of, but helped me get away from the relationship was fighting back. Um, I was never a fighter before I got with her, but I learned how to fight being with her. <laughs> uh, again, not one of my proudest moments, but I think the one thing that I really take away from that is the fact that this all happened in front of my kids and they're adults now, but um, as a family, meaning me and them, we are working together to um, kind of rebuild the trust and rebuild the respect and rebuild the boundary setting and um, to let them know that I was trying to protect them a lot of the times because they felt that I was choosing my relationship over them. But in actuality, what I was really trying to do was keep the peace. So anytime she would call me, I would run. Because if I didn't, then it was a problem and it would turn into a physical altercation. Um, how I got away, uh, she actually moved down here with me. Um, I'm originally from Connecticut. So I moved to South Carolina 12 years ago. Um, and she, she came with me. Um, I didn't beg her to come. It was kind of, I was kind of hoping she would stay back in Connecticut, but she ended up falling down here with me. And um, I finally told her, like, I'm done with this relationship. And it took me to literally talk to someone else and have her catch me in the act. And she's like, that's it. I'm done. I'm like, oh. so uh, when she said she was leaving, I wasted no time in packing the bags for her. Um, before the ticket was even bought for her to go back up north. So um, I think I, I was tapped out mentally and physically with her about year six, six and a half. Um, so about the year and a half after that, it was just kind of just rolling with the waves of it. You know what I mean? Um, I went through a lot of verbal abuse, especially coming up as a child. 
um, in the home and outside of the home. Um, but I can say that at this point in my life, I am definitely on a healing journey. And um, if there's any kind of advice that I could give to someone going through it or has gone through it, I would definitely advocate that get all the help that you can get, get all the support you can get, but definitely heal because you do not want to carry the hurt and the pain from a previous relationship onto your next one. The whole point is to heal and release all of that toxic toxicity and just let it go because you will be blessed with something even better than where you came from. And I know at times it feels like I'll never find somebody good enough. No, you will. You will. So, but that's my story. I don't want to take up too much time because I know we got a few people on here tonight. So, but um, I'm always open. My DMs always open. Inbox is always open. So if anybody needs to talk, I'm always here. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, and I appreciate you, you know, sharing that, you know, your children were affected and just being on a healing journey. And I can say that even though I've been out of an abusive relationship for a while now, I still get triggered and I still have things that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. um, and I see some heads nodding saying, yeah, like it's, this is a forever journey. This is not Absolutely. the thing that you just, it's gone and it's, it's always going to be, yeah, it's always going to take work, but as long as you're willing to put forth the effort to do the work, you should be fine. And that's why I really want to implement the whole importance of having a support system, because when you do feel triggered, you have that support system to to be there for you. So you're not feeling alone in the process. You're not feeling like you're by yourself. Like, oh my God, am I doing this right? Am I doing this wrong? If you have your support system, the people who really genuinely love you and want the best for you, they're going to tell you, no, you're fine. Lean on me. I got your back, that kind of thing. Because at the end of the day, it's about you. It's not about your partner. It's not about the person who hurts you. It's about you because tomorrow is your day. Mm -hmm. Yesterday is gone. We can't, we, we can always replay it in our mind, but we can't go back and change anything from the day before, but we can always change today to make tomorrow better. Yes. Yes. I love that. It's about you today. It's not about yesterday. I love that. I love that. And I, I think it's really important for those that are listening that might be currently in relationships is to know that it is about you. It's not about them. It's about you saving your life because domestic violence homicides happen every day. <laughs> domestic violence happens they say every 20 seconds or every 20 minutes i need to look that up and make sure but it happens every day at least once an hour i will say that so domestic violence happens um and so it's not about them and i'm going to say that again it's not about them i don't care how much you love them i don't care how i don't care if you have children with them I'm going to say that I don't care if you have children with them because you owe it to yourself and you owe it to your children to get out of that situation. Because if they have not turned their abuse towards your children, they will point blank. They will, they're not going to be abusive to you and never, ever, ever, ever abuse your children. That's never going to happen. <laughs> never. Okay. Whether, whether it's abuse, abuse mentally, emotionally, physically, sexually, financially, spiritually, those are all the forms of domestic violence. No matter if they're hitting your kids or not, I don't know anybody, any victim or survivor who can say that they never turned on their children. I don't know anyone that can say that. If there is somebody that can say, oh, he was rainbows and butterflies with my kids and he was not abusive to them in no way, shape, or form, I would love for you to comment on the thing right now and let me know that the, the abuse was never turned towards your children. I don't know anybody that can say that. So prove me wrong. I would love for you to prove me wrong because <laughs> we don't want our children abused and we don't want our children to be a part of 
anything, any domestic violence in any form targeted towards our children. However, even if they are not physically abusive to them, emotionally abusive to them, mentally abusive to them, they are still being abusive to them because they're being abusive to you, <laughs> period. <laughs> and if they're witnessing it, they're being abusive to them. So if anyone can tell me or if anyone can say they've never been abusive to their children and your children were never home when they hit you, cussed you out, called you names, demeaned you or whatever form of abuse they did towards you and they were never home during that time, they never witnessed it, please go into the chat or the comments or something and tell me because I want to know how you shielded them from ever witnessing it. And I'm gonna say kudos to you for doing whatever it is you did to protect them. I wanna hear from you because we need that information. We need to know how you protected your children from never witnessing it and never being, never being abused ever by your abuser. I wanna know, I wanna know what you did because I'm pretty sure that if you are able to say that, that they never witnessed it, never experienced any form of abuse from your abuser, then you went through great lengths, probably life-threatening lens to, to protect them. And I applaud you for shielding them. However it is that you did that. I wanna hear from you because that's important. We need to hear that. Um, and I'm not being a smart ass. I'm being very, very honest. So um, domestic violence affects everybody in the home, no matter what the age, no matter who's the target, everybody experiences it. And so I hate that your child was hurt while you were trying to protect yourself, Tiffany. And I'm sure our other panelists are gonna share how their children were affected. But I hate that your child, your child was affected, but I'm also very proud of you for realizing like, I don't have to put up with this and I'm done. But I also heard something that you said that I started talking to someone else to get them to break up with me. That's what it sounded like. Was that that was that the reasoning? Did I hear that? Is that how it went? Did you start talking to someone else to try to get them to break up with you? Or did I not hear that right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So <laughs> I was talking, I was actually talking to someone like outside of the country. And it wasn't even on that kind of a level, but I was trying to get her to think like I was talking to them, like yeah. we're gonna get together. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. But um <laughs> She's like, oh, who is this? And I'm like, oh, you know, just somebody I'm talking to. Because I told her to go, just go. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm good. It's like, I can't leave you. I love you. You're my best friend. And um, she just would not take the, the, the lead of leaving because I was done. I was literally tapped out. And um then finally it took her to see that I was talking to someone and she was just like, I'm done. So she called her mom before her mom could even get the plane ticket. I had her bags packed. <laughs> yeah. I think that had to have been like, at that point, that was like my longest relationship I'd ever been in, but my easiest breakup. Like I didn't even cry. I really wanted to throw a party. Like after she left, like finally I'm free. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It's just, there was so much turmoil and chaos. And uh, it's just, when you finally get out of it, you're like, oh. it literally felt like a weight was just taken off of my, my shoulders. Right. And then the, and then the real work begins. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Because I'll tell you from that point on to like present day, I'm realizing that there's a lot of things from my childhood that had I not gone through or had I um like taken on heal you know the 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 trauma and really sat with it I probably wouldn't even have gone into a relationship with her. Right. So that's why I, I say it's really important to really get help like therapy and because it does play a toll on your mentality like your mental stability like I don't know if you guys have ever looked into um, how narcissistic abuse can lead to your brain, just like the cortisol levels go super high and your 
brain, it gets used to that. Mm -hmm. So you're always like in fight or flight mode and it causes so much stress on your body. Like it's not just (laughs) in the moment of abuse, like this thing can carry on for years Mm -hmm. and it can do a lot of damage to your body. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to talk about how to get out of relationships safely um, with uh, C. Duane and all of you, I want y'all to tell how you got out of your relationship safely. So I'm going to say, and this is, I love Tiffany with everything in me, but I do not recommend <laughs> letting yeah, no, partner- don't do what I did. Don't yeah, do what I did. Don't, because that don't do what I did. <laughs> I, yeah, I had to play, I had to play the, the, the temperature of the relationship at that time. Yeah. So I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty smart when it comes to things. Like if I had yeah. to play my time out, I'll do it. If it's, if that's going to help me get out. Um, if you guys tune in with us on in January, you'll hear my story about trafficking because I'm a survivor of trafficking. So getting out of that, mm-hmm. you'll understand where my, my mind is at. Yeah. Um, I think I have, uh, it's a, it's a syndrome. I can't remember the name of it where you kind of like, you're um sympathetic to your captors mm-hmm. yep yep i know what you're talking about i'll find the term so, before we get off <laughs> yeah, stop yeah. Stop yes yes yes, stop stop yes. 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 so i think that's my strong suit it's sad yeah. that i even have to say that but yeah. um i think that's what really kind of got me through yeah so just to, to go back to what i said about don't try this at home <laughs> like literally <laughs> um Part of what abuser does is they isolate you from your family and friends. So any any sign that you're connecting with someone else can be deadly. So that's why I said, don't try this because you possibly talking to someone else or engaging with someone else could possibly set them off and it can be really dangerous. So even though it worked um, and Tiffany's benefit, it, it, I would say the majority of times it does not. Um, so do not go that route and just know that that is something that abusers do across the board. They try to isolate you from your friends and family. So you have no one to talk to. And then on top of it, you're scared to talk to other people. Um, and so what I do encourage you though, is to maintain ties with people that you trust safely so that when you're ready to go, you have people to help you leave. I will say that. Um, so uh, Tiffany is gonna be sharing a poem later today or later on the episode um, about surviving domestic violence. So we're gonna look forward to that. Um, next, we wanna talk to Miss um, Ropi Hill. She's also um, a cast member on our The Private Room with Tiffany. Um, and she's gonna share her story um, And hers has a little twist. So she's going to share her story with us now. So I am Ropey Hill. I am also a survivor of domestic violence as well as an abuser. Um, I was married to my first husband and he wasn't so much physically abusive. He was more like verbally and mentally abusive. But he would do it so good to the point where he would um, scare me into thinking that he was gonna hit me or do something to me until the point one day, I just decided I was like, you know what, enough is enough, been through this. And um, I locked the doors and I told him, I said, whoever make it out this room today to tell the story, that's the win and that's how it's gonna go down. Luckily for me, he took off running in the other direction and I moved to a whole nother state to get away from him and then I met someone else who was supposed to be the love of my life and he was everything to me my children treated me like a queen my kids like parents wanted me to marry him family wanted me to marry him it was just like perfect and so that was good all the way up until he actually went to prison and when he went to prison it triggered his schizophrenia. And so he became home as a schizophrenic and an alcoholic, which made him very, very mean. And he became the physical abuser. 
And we went through so much like hell and high water. And I told you like the first time, the first husband, I locked the doors. And when I locked the doors on him, that's when I made up in my mind that I would never ever let another man put me in a situation or, you know, a position where I would have to defend myself because I would. Yeah, it's done. And so that being said, I became the abuser. So every time he would get up in my face and he would say something or disrespect me, I would go to him. It was just like automatic. And he was the type that like he, he was six, six. So with him being as big as he was, he would get up in my face and he would think he would intimidate me. And at first it did, but then my fight or flight response would kick in and I would fight. So I ended up with a charge of attempted murder because he flipped out one night on me and I ended up stabbing him five times. I went to jail and had to serve a little bit of time for that. But, you know, by the time I got to court and everything, by the grace of God, they dropped it down to an assault with a deadly weapon with the intent to inflict. So I no longer was up for, um, you know, serious charges. Those are serious charges, but it wasn't like I just tried to kill somebody. Um, I still stayed with him because I knew that he had a mental illness. And so it wasn't just like, you know, he just woke up in the morning and decided, hey, I want to beat her ass today. No, that's not how mine went down. His, like the voices in his head would literally tell him scenarios and I would have to live with that and deal with it. And then by him drinking, wouldn't want to take medication. So just made the situation even worse. And like Tiffany said, over the time, you know, I went to, I ended up going to jail like four times behind him. And on the fourth time, it became to the point where my children decided to jump in. My son was, uh, I want to say like 13 at the time. And I had promised my kids the last time I went to jail. I said, I'm not going back to jail ever again, especially behind your father. I will not do that to y'all. So this particular day, um, he and I got into it and I decided I wasn't like, I'm done. And it was more so because he had went to rehab and did all of this other stuff, trying to get his stuff together. But then he came home from graduating rehab, getting as high as he possibly could and as drunk as he possibly could. So I was like, that didn't make sense. And at that point, I knew he wasn't serious about getting himself together. So I started making preparations to leave. And most time, women, when we leave, we leave first mentally. Then we leave emotionally. And then next thing you know, we out the door. So at this point, I was mentally and emotionally gone. And so he came home flipping out again one day. And I took my purse and I sat down at my kitchen table and my two older kids was in the living room with me. And he came getting up in my face, just yelling and doing, I just held on to my pocketbook. I was trying to hold my restraints, not to fight him or do anything. Cause I said, I wasn't going back to jail. So this fool decides, oh, he see I'm not fighting him back. So he goes outside and calls the police and tells them that I just punched him in the face. I just spit at him. And I wouldn't let him in the house. So I'm hearing all of this, like he really just called the police on me and I ain't did nothing but sit at my table holding my pocketbook. So the police get there. And of course they ready to take me to jail because he didn't went out there and scratched his face to make it seem like I put bruises on him. So I would go to jail. But luckily my two children were there and were witnessing it. But before the police had got there, he got in my face again. And at that point, my son, my 13 year old son came running down the stairs. And before I knew him and his father in their fight. And at that point I knew like, I got to leave this man alone because if my son gets hurt behind him fighting his father, that's gonna be a whole nother scenario. Or if he hurts my son fighting him, then I gotta jump in and it's gonna be something else. And at this point, I didn't already try to kill you one time. So at this point, I don't care about killing you. So I knew it was time for me to let him go. So. My kids told the police, like my mom was sitting here at the table, she didn't touch this man, no, none of that. And luckily they took my, my kids word for it or I'd have been in jail again behind him. And I didn't really leave him alone at that point, but how I did leave him alone, he went to work. He went to work every morning at five o'clock. 
And when he went to work, I got the kids up. I waited until about 5.30 where I knew he was gone. Didn't have to come back because he forgot something or whatever. And I told him I went in there and woke up the kids. And I told him, I said, I need y'all to go in there and get a trash bag. Pack up everything that you want to take with you and put it in this trash bag. You, Because you will never see any of this other stuff again. So make sure it's something that you want and you're going to keep. Because we're never coming here again. And at 6 o'clock in the morning, me and my children got in my car with our trash bags and left. He didn't even know we was gone. Like, he didn't even recognize our clothes was gone. Like, nothing. It wasn't until we didn't show up by 12 o'clock that night. Then he wants to call my phone. Where y'all at? Where the kids at? And I'm like, didn't answer the phone. And he just kept calling and kept calling. And I didn't answer. And that's how I left him alone to the point where he just stopped calling, stopped looking, whatever. Me and my kids slept in the car for two years, homeless, to get away from him. So it's like when you're tired of whatever you're going through, when you get sick and tired and be tired and tired, it doesn't matter what you have to do to get out of that situation. And it's scary. It really, really is scary because I didn't know where we were going to go. I didn't know like how we were going to make it or any of that. But what I did know is I could wake up in the morning with my kids. I didn't have to argue. I can go to bed at night. Didn't have to argue. I didn't have to worry about going to jail no more. And me sleeping in my car with my kids was like the best time. And only it not only made us stronger as a family, but it made me stronger as a woman. And that's my story. Thank you, mute, I can't hear nobody. Is anybody saying anything? Sorry, I didn't realize I was on mute. Sorry. Um, so what I wanted to say is that Ro is sharing both sides of the story. But what I would like to say to you, Ro, is that your story as becoming the abuser is not uncommon for victims of domestic violence that have not had therapy, have not had counseling, have not addressed the trauma, have not addressed the abuse. And you went, you go into protective mode. Anything someone does that is aggressive, you feel like you have to defend yourself in whatever way, shape or form, whether that's hitting, cussing, calling names, um, that is something that does happen. And I've seen it where the victim is, is now doing things to protect themselves, even to the point of being physical because they're seeing patterns with their new relationship or they're seeing patterns in their existing relationship that are threatening to them. So that doesn't mean that it's okay to stab someone because it's not, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that it is common for victims to become aggressive after being in an abusive relationship because they feel like, oh no, this person is coming towards me too fast or they're getting too close. They're in my personal space or they're yelling at me. And now I have to protect myself. And the only way I know how to protect myself is to fight because I have to protect myself. I don't know what this person is going to do with me. So I have seen that in a lot of relationships after a person gets out of domestic violence relationship where the victim becomes very aggressive in their next relationship because they haven't addressed the trauma and they haven't healed completely um, where they become aggressive. And that's happened to me. I've become aggressive in relationships um, because there is something that the next person did that was very, very similar to my abuser that was now like, hold up. <laughs> get out my face. Don't yell at me. Don't do that. And I'm just like, okay, 
Now I got to protect myself because you're about to do what my abuser did. And so, but I, let me say, hold on, let me say this. Mm -hmm. When I stabbed him five times, it wasn't because he just like came at me and I thought he was going to do something to me. No, he literally drop kicked me down to the ground, got on top of me, started choking me, trying to gouge my eyes out. And I literally had scissors like in my pocket because I was trying to leave and walk away from the situation. And in the neighborhood that I lived in, it wasn't a good neighborhood. So um, the scissors I had in my pocket was for my protection from me walking up the street. But when I got up to like the top of the street, he called my name and I turned around to like be like, what? And he came running at me full speed and he dropped, kicked me to the ground and literally got on top of me and started choking me. And he, when he couldn't choke me, he started going like toward trying to push my eyes out of my eye socket. And I mm. took the scissors out of my pocket and just started stabbing. And he mm. still didn't move. Even after I had stabbed him five times, he still did not get up off of me. It just so happened that my neighbor was riding down the road and seeing him on top of somebody and thought he was going to get out and help him fight. But he saw it was me and he tackled him to the ground. And at that point, I could get up and run away. So, yeah, yeah if you got to stab somebody to get up out of the situation, stab the shit out their ass. I ain't going to sit here and say do it because it's better that you protect yourself and live to tell the story about it tomorrow, then your family members be burying you. So if you got to do whatever it takes to get out of a situation, don't think about their life because they're not giving a fuck about yours. Stab them, shoot them, ask questions later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I appreciate you asking, I mean, adding that part because it, it, as I was saying, it is very common for victims to become aggressive in their next relationship, but Sometimes you have to defend yourself and there are consequences to you defending yourself against your abuser. I've seen your situation, Ro. I've seen another very good friend of mine, very professional woman, very high in her career, defend herself against her abuser who was abusive to her for over 10 years. There was record of the abuse. And this one day she said, enough is enough. She tried to leave like you and she hit him with her car. He came, he got up, came through the window, tried to grab her out the car and she stabbed him. I think she had something in her console or something. And he pressed charges against her and she lost her very, very high paying job that she had worked 20 plus years to get. Had Who cares? She's still here alive today to get another one. Yep. And she That's is so alive to talk about it. She's alive to talk right. about it. She got a lawyer. She fought the charges. And it did affect her life. It's still affecting her life. But she's alive. And her children have their mother. Um, so I'm not saying violence is the answer. However, there's such thing as um self-defense and you have the right to defend your life not saying that violence is the answer but you have the right to defend yourself and to be alive for your children to see you tomorrow you have that right and unfortunately i've seen so many times where survivors, and I'm calling them survivors because they're no longer in that relationship. They fought tooth and nail, even to the point of stabbing, hitting, hitting with a car, shooting, whatever, to get out of that relationship. But they dealt with the consequences because they knew that they, it was either them or their abuser. And they did what they had to do to get out of the relationship. And they dealt with the consequences. And unfortunately, there's a lot of women that are in jail serving life sentences for killing their abusers. However, they're alive. So I'm not saying that violence is the answer. We're not endorsing violence in any way, shape, or form. However, if you have to do what you have to do to get out of that relationship, if someone is hitting you, trying to shoot you, stab you, punching you, kicking you, throwing you down the steps, so forth and so on, you do what you have to do to get out of that situation and to get out of that, that violent atmosphere you have to do what you have to do. You have to protect yourselves. And unfortunately, there are advocates out here that can help you. There are p lawyers that are now um, representing domestic violence survivors. Help them beat these charges where you are actually defending yourself. 
There are lawyers that are doing that. There are advocates that are sp specifically for that cause. There are organizations that specialize in helping victims or survivors who have been falsely charged for whatever the consequence is to the abuser because there is documentation and there's a history of domestic violence and they did what they had to do in that moment where they were being, their life was being threatened again and something happened to the abuser. So thank you for sharing and being transparent and open about both sides because it happens. It happens. I know it happened for me. I became very aggressive in relationships because it was my way of, of protecting myself. And that's what therapy and counseling had to do for me is for me to recognize that I had a pattern of being in, in abusive relationships and that I needed to heal myself before I got into another relationship so that I didn't respond to everything in such a a, in such an aggressive manner. So thank you for sharing that. That's not easy to share at all, Ro. So. Oh yeah, y'all, I'm sorry. I did get therapy and get help. So I'm no longer that person and I worked hard in the past three years not to be her anymore. So yes, I did get help for my anger issues and all of that good stuff, okay? <laughs> thank you, thank you. I appreciate you so much for sharing that because it's not easy to share. We, we, like, we tend to share stories that make us look like the better person. And so I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you were able to share that with us and you've shared that more than once. So I appreciate you and I love you for that. Thank you. Um, next, we're gonna talk to Barry. Um, Barry um, has shared with us that he was a victim of domestic abuse um, in a previous relationship. And so we're going to hear from Barry. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm glad to have the opportunity to kind of give, you know, the man's perspective on this a little bit. Um, not that physical abuse never happens towards men, but I think in general, it it is different. And there's a stigma that if um, somehow you're accepting that or you say something about it, that somehow you're weak or whatever. But it's so easy to be manipulated when you're, you know, in a relationship and you're in love and you want things to work and you got kids involved and money involved. And <clears throat> so most of my experience was um, verbal abuse and um having things held over me and, um, you know, like money and finances and home and everything. And then at the same time, having it switched on me on a daily basis, like, oh, you're so sensitive. Why are you upset? You're overthinking. You're too sensitive. You know, I'm just like that. Um, you know, and going to bed and like traumatized every night and waking up the next day like oh what are you worried about it's fine we're fine we're good i was just you know that's just the way i am um and when you're in the middle of it it's really hard to see it and it it was to the point where this one particular person and it's not the first time it's happened but this one particular person was actually trying to get me to be physically abusive with her so she could turn that against me as well like to the point of getting in my face like you know you want to hit me why don't you just do it you know just like really pushing as hard as she could and um you know look luckily i think you know i attribute it to the way my father raised me but um you know i never allowed myself to go there but but don't think my temper wasn't there enough to go there. So I can see how people can, you know, victim can very easily be become the aggressor. Um, and I just, um, I think one of the big points I want to be here for is, you know, men don't talk about it. And I know, I know from being on the, the Kings um, panel, that's most men have experienced it. And most of them never talked about it. And most of them never got help. And I think it's important if there are any men out here listening to the podcast tonight that no, you're not alone. And and it sucks. And talk to somebody, you know? 
find find a, a therapist or a mentor or like-minded men or something um because it it happens to men too thank you for um sharing your story um barry you've shared um before about the abuse that you had to deal with and um you brought up something that I think is worth talking about is the fact that they made light of it and they made it seem as if, oh, this is just me. Like it's nothing wrong with it <laughs> or you know me or whatever. And that you would go to bed fearful and wake up as if, and that person acted as if nothing happened. And I think that that's where we can talk about the cycle of abuse and how the person will, um, They'll honeymoon you. So they're, they're, they're being sweet. They're giving you gifts. They're taking you on dates. They're giving you great sex and everything is just great, right? And then you do something, no matter how slight, it could be dinner wasn't ready in time when they wanted it to be, or you didn't give them a hug when they expected it, or the kids started screaming like children do. It can take the littlest thing and they snap. And now they're aggressive towards you, they hit you, they call you names, they're putting you down, all of these things. And then you go through the, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I didn't mean to hurt you. I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I blinked out or, you know, you shouldn't have made me do that. You know, why did you do that? So forth and so on. And then they go back to, that, oh, I love you. Let's date, let's go out on a date. They start buying you stuff and all that kind of stuff. So that's that cycle of abuse that, a domestic violence goes through no matter what what form and it goes in the cycle and it keeps going and going and going until one day the victim is like wait this shit ain't right <laughs> i'm not dealing with this this is not right i don't want your flowers i don't want no more sex i don't want to go out on a date don't bring me no jewelry even though we love jewelry ladies don't know and you realize wait this is, this something is wrong here. <laughs> and it, it takes for something, it, it has to be that big something. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. It's going to take that big something where you're just like, you know what? I'm not doing this no more. And I, and I'm, I think I'm, for not, me, I'm not doing it, this cycle anymore. I'm not staying on this roller coaster with you. Go ahead, Barry. I, I think for me, it, I, I didn't even get the apologies. It was more like the, oh, you're so sensitive. You know, grow up here. I, I was just, I was just playing, you know how I am, you yeah. know, and you believe it for the longest time. And I got to that point where you're talking about where it's like, I don't want to be here anymore. I'm not happy. And I remember when I finally told my kids and they were uh, 15 and 16 at the time that I was leaving. I remember when my youngest daughter looked at me and said, just promise me you won't go back. And yeah. that was the moment that I realized that they saw it a long time ago. Right. I didn't see it, but they saw our it a long kids. time ago. Our kids are so smart. We don't give our children credit. <laughs> we don't give our children credit. You know, Tiffany's son got a, a busted lip. Ropey's son had to jump in and protect his to protect his mom. And your your child was like, "Look, good for you, Dad. Don't go back." Well, and I think I think that's one of the tactics that are used a lot too is the kind of alienating you from your only ch your own children, right. like you know, you know, oh, why are you treating them so? You should be disciplining them. You shouldn't be treating them like they're special. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's one of the tactics that are used by a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. If you have children, they're going to use your children. They are going to use your children. So if you have children. They are going to use your children, even if it's calling you a bad mother, a bad father, or you do too much, or they get jealous of the children when you're giving them hugs and kisses and affection to, you know, something so simple as why are you feeding them first? Or why did you go to their PTA meeting? Or, you know, the stuff that you're supposed to be doing as a parent, they're going to use your children in some way, shape or form. And it might come off as concern. Like, you know, you really should discipline them more because they they were bad when it's really like you should have beat them up because I beat you up or you should have done this to them because I would do that or, you know, 
they're trying to put the guilt trip on you, but they will use your children in some way, shape or form. And it might be something small where you don't even realize it, but eventually it grows because they know that as mothers and as, as fathers, as parents, that your children hopefully are everything to you and your the world to you. And so those are the people that they're going to use against you as those people that are the closest to you. And if you don't have children, they'll use your parents. If they don't use your parents and your children, then they'll use your best friend. Your best friend, oh, she's just jealous. She's just jealous because she ain't got no man. You know how many times I've heard that? <laughs> she ain't got no man. That's the reason why she don't like me and she's talking to you and telling you to leave me. No, your best friend is looking out for you because they don't want you to get killed, but they're going to make it seem as if. Oh, no, we fucking. Me and the best oh, friend yeah. fucking. Yeah, that's, yeah. They want me. That's why. That's mm -hmm. why. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's another one. <laughs> yeah yeah you're sleeping with you're sleeping with your best friend you're sleeping with your guy friend or your female friend mm -hmm. and you're cheating on them and they become delusional and paranoid that's another sign of an abuser is when they just they're paranoid and they accuse you of things a lot yes Mr. can King. i add something so like in my situation if i was like if i got up one day and decided like i just wanted to do my hair and put makeup on for myself what you getting all dressed up for? Right. Oh, you going out with? <laughs> or if I had a friend from work, oh, what you fucking them? <laughs> uh, no, like I can't have a conversation. And it would have just been like a conversation. Like we were talking about work stuff because right. she worked um, in the same place that I did. I just worked in a different department. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was a lot of like interjecting. And this, and, and you're absolutely right. She did use the kids a lot. Like whenever I would try to get up and leave to walk away from the situation, she would jump in front of the door and say, you're not going nowhere. You're going to talk to me. And I'm like, move, please. Mm -hmm. Oh, if you leave, I'm, I'm going to call DSS, tell them that you did it da with to your kids or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then here comes my daughter, spicy as she is. <laughs> no, she didn't. <laughs> don't lie <laughs> so my kids always had my back but I just felt like I failed as a mom because I felt like I didn't have their back enough yeah. even though and they didn't understand that when I whenever she would call and I would run that it wasn't because I was trying to neglect or ignore them it was because if I didn't come when she when she called then it was her hand upside my head or you know drama yeah. and I just didn't want that so now that they're adults and I explained it to them they get it but they're like it's kind of like a little too late because yeah. the effect affected them already yeah but like I said we're we're working on it we're working on it so it's never too late to have those conversations and that's another good point that you that you brought up abusers know the system <laughs> yeah. it's very rare that you're the first person that they've been abusive to especially if you're over 21, they've done this before. So they know the system. They know that if they have any kind of mark, bruise, scratch, like Rose's husband went out and scratched himself, they know how to use the system because they've been in the system before or they've been faced with the system. So they're very smart and very calculating and very manip manipulative and vindictive. Um, so you have to be really, really careful. So thank you, Barry, for sharing your story. Um, I know I'm trying to think, making sure I'm not missing anything. No, I'm not. So um, our next person, I do not see her on here. Okay, so we'll keep moving. So our next um, young lady that's going to share her story is Miss Davina. Miss Davina is going to share her story with us. <laughs> Are you having technical difficulties, Mr. Bean? Oh, there she goes. There she goes. Okay, there we go. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, all okay. the time. <laughs> um, hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, I'm Dina. Uh, this is like something big because um, you know, it's on Facebook. So, like I told you guys before, <laughs> it's gonna be a you know a a lot of people find things out for the first time. Um, so, only share what you're comfortable with, Davina. Okay, this um, is a safe space. Okay, okay. 
you know, so, you know, um, you know, I'm not gonna bash him, but I met him when I was about nineteen, twenty. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on Zoom. Go, no, go. But I'm sorry, my grandkids. Take the dog. Um, I met him about nineteen, twenty. Um, everything was good at first. Um. It was, it was going well. Um, my daughter, I had just had my daughter had her premature. Um, I had her twenty six. Um, so she was on how she was born, and I um, uh, one night me and her, me and uh, her spent a night over there with them, and um, she came home. You know, the preemies when they send you home after months, you know, in the hospital, they send them home with oxygen tank, heart monitor, you know, all that, all that stuff. So. I was taking that and I thought she was okay, but I didn't realize that her heart monitor, you know, had stopped beating. You know, what's going on? So I had to tell her, and she had to stop breathing. And Davina, in order for you to discharge a preemie, you, Davina. Uh, it's hard for us to hear you. A couple of people yeah. is having a hard time hearing you. Is it possible for you to go out and come back in? Because we, we can't hear everything you're saying. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we want people to hear your story. Please. A couple of us can't hear you. Okay. Um, while we're waiting for her to come back in, because we really do want to hear Davina's story. Um, it took a lot for her to come on. Um, this is her first time sharing her story as a whole, so we want to make sure that we can support her. Um, so we'll wait for her to come back. Um, Nikki um, is our next speaker survivor that's going to share her story, and we'll come back to Davina when she connects back with us. So, Miss Nikki, sorry, I had to unmute. Um, okay, so um, first off. I have a history of um, multiple abusive relationships um, and they have gotten progressively worse. Um, so a lot of it, uh, unresolved childhood, um, you know, I was raised in, in uh, some domestic violence to the point where I didn't even realize I was in a domestic violence relationship until after I got out of my first one. Um, and some things that I noticed that I've done in, in the past is, is that I'm really, really good at sweeping everything under the rug um, to the point where I almost believe the, the own nonsense that I tell people to make the other person look good when I know darn well what's really going on in the home. Um, but so, uh, so I could touch on it a lot because I've had multiple partners that were abusive, but I'm going to touch on my last uh, relationship because it was like the worst and it's most recent. I'm 18 months, almost 19 months out of that relationship. Um, and there's drugs with my story as well. I'm also uh, almost 19 months clean and sober as well. So yes. <laughs> so I left my abuser and um, found recovery. Um, but um you know, I, I was with this man for three years. And when I first met him, all the normal, you know, he, I was just getting out of a marriage that was 20 years long. You know, I met my husband at the time when I was like 15 and a half, moved in 16, spent 20 years with him, buried a child with him. So when I get out of that marriage, I've never been alone a day in my life. Um, and this gentleman knew that. And so I heard all the things I wanted to hear, um, you know, that I was beautiful and, you know, just over the top, um, all the promises, just, just everything. But, um, there was also drugs though. So, um, you add that into the mix and, um, he ended up moving in with me and I, I do have a child, um, that's a teenager. And so, um, we met in recovery, like, uh, we were in recovery or at least I was, and he said he was, but he wasn't. And, um, I relapsed and, and then, so then we go on this big, um, you know, traveling of drugs together. 
and he lived with me and um, it started off with all the whole slowly isolating me from people. Um, I was constantly cheating on him. Who am I talking to? A lot of paranoia, but that also came with the drugs. Um, I wasn't allowed to talk to my normal friends or, or he wouldn't um, say, no, you can't do this or go there. But if I did, when I came home, life was so miserable um, from my room being destroyed to, you know, he's just in a bad mood to, to just all the things that he would do to the point where I would go ahead and make that choice now without him even having to make the choice. Cause it wasn't worth going through all the drama that's going to come with the choice of going. So I started like saying no to my friends and people, even though he didn't tell me I couldn't say no. So he looks like he's not controlling me. Like you should go, but I knew what you should go meant. You should go, Matt, I was coming home to my room completely destroyed. You know, you should go, meant, you know, violence. It just meant a lot of things. So um, I slowly cut people out as well. And then, um, and then if there was anyone, it was always, you know, they wanted him, of course, especially if it was a woman. Oh, they were trying to sleep with him when I wasn't looking. So now me and the girlfriend aren't talking. Um, you know, family just hates him, just all the things that um, come. But um, I, I want to admit, because I know that I'm not the only woman, and I think it's really important because it's something like us women don't like to admit or talk about. But um, this man, like, got very, very physical to the point where he almost killed me more than one time. And I went back, despite the fact that I knew I knew that um, it was dangerous for my child. And um, so the the first time he was like really, really drunk and um, he, you know, cut me open um, down, down below, um, you know, forced himself on me, um, you know, peed on me, all that um, because I was sleeping with the neighbor, um, but I wasn't. Um, and my neighbor's a woman and not, not saying anything about anyone, but she, you know, is in a relationship with another woman, and that was not the case, but that's what he believed at the time, um, and did some other things, and um, my brothers helped get him out the house, and um, he left, and I was back to him in a couple of days. Um, I went right back to him, um, and blamed the, if he wasn't drunk, if, if we weren't up for so long, if you know, he's amazing when we're not on drugs. Um, it was my fault. And so I would go back and every time I went back, I would try to be better. And, um, but I also would try to control his drinking and like, well, as long as you don't drink and, you know, looking back, I thought, you know, he felt bad that he drank and like he wanted, but he never really even apologized. I don't, I dreamed that up in my own head, I guess. I don't know, because looking back, I'm like, he never promised me not to do that again, but I believed he wouldn't. Um, eventually he did that when I was, because eventually I got sick of it. And I'm like, you know, I'm, every time this happened, even though I'd go back, I, I was getting stronger to leave eventually. But um, so I go back and, and the friends are in my ear. Um, People have known me my whole life, even though I'm strung out on drugs, they still knew me like besides being on drugs, like you don't come around, you're not calling, you don't have your phone. I couldn't have my phone because it was a fight. If my phone dung one message, it was like, who are you talking to? And it would turn into such a fight to where I didn't even just, I just didn't even want the phone. Like I just, it wasn't worth it, you know, um, you know, just obsessed with my phone 24 seven, which is funny. Cause then I find out he's the one that had a bunch of women and he had a problem with um, prostitutes and and that's why he was so crazy with my phone but I didn't know that at the time at the time I kept thinking why can't I be good enough why am I not doing everything right why is it every man I get with it seems to be this problem um so uh I continue on trying um now there's drugs involved so like we're in and out of uh, rehabs and jails and um, strung outness and living together, not living together um, because of, of uh, jail and all that. And that was the only time I got peace. And every time he went to jail is when I was starting to like get freedom. And 
um, I would get sober every time he went to jail. And, um, but then as soon as he got out, I'd go right back. And when I went right back, I would go right back to the drugs, right back to him. And the abuse would just pick up where it left off. Um, there was multiple occasions where, you know, he choked me with phone cords, um, you know, just you name it. And, um, eventually the very last time, um, he was, he was up for a very long time. We were both strung out and, um, he almost like he poisoned me and was going to light me on fire. Um, I don't remember. There's a lot of things I don't remember because I don't know what exactly happened. I was in and out of it, but I remember waking up to him and just a lot of like really bad memories. Um, and I remember thinking if I don't get out of this house, I'm going to freaking die. And he kept talking about like taking me to paradise. Um, and it was all again, all, you know, I'm cheating on him. If, uh, no one, if he can't have me, no one could have me. Um, and like, that was always the, that was always the fight. Um, and, um, what's interesting though, is that day, that morning, like prior, I knew in the pit of my stomach, like I knew I had to get away from him and I still didn't leave. Like, it's the weirdest thing. Like I remember thinking he has that look in his eye, you know, and that night prior, we got into a fight. I did leave. And then I went to like a gas station and I got him a beer, which makes no sense. And like, I, I'm sorry. And, you know, and he's like, I need you. I love you. And I go right back. Um, I could have saved myself a lot of trauma if I didn't, but um, I knew in the pit of my stomach. And so then when I woke up and I came to, I'm like, if I don't leave, I'm going to die. And we fought some more. And I, every time I, I don't know exactly like what was given to me, I have my ideas, but like, I could only take so many steps and get so far before I pass out again. And I'd wake back up. So like, it took a long time for me to get from point A to out the freaking door and home. And by the time I got there, like my skin started opening up from the inside out. Um, and um, so we called poison control and they said, you gotta get to the hospital. So I get to the hospital, you know, and all those things. And I would love to say that because of the man he was and because how he even like hit on my daughter and made some sexual advances with her because he beat me, he almost killed me. All the things that he almost did, I would love to tell you that that was enough to make me leave him. But honestly, I feel if I would have got out of that hospital, I would have went right back. The only thing that saved me was, is the um, feds came and raided him while I was there. And luckily he got busted with a large amount of drugs and he went to jail. Um, and that's what made me go to rehab. And when I went to rehab, there was like an angel there that knows that I was in a domestic violence situation because I would always end up back in rehab after he'd do what he does. And she got tired of it and she spoke up because like when you're in rehab, they're supposed to only speak upon rehab, you know, and she just did a whole class on domestic violence and the signs and symptoms. And she just called me out and she was like, you know, one day you're not going to get to come back to rehab because I'm going to read about you in the paper. Either you OD or you, he kills you. And he's like, will you please, you know, go get some help. And so I went to someplace safe and they helped me get a restraining order and like taught me um, and showed me the wheel. And like, I, I, it took then for me to realize, like, even though I share all this and it sounds like any other person would be like, yeah, it's definitely a domestic violence situation. All through that, I, it was like, I was trying to convince myself that I really was in one. And then as soon as I would convince myself, I'd have a million excuses on why it wasn't one and that it was my fault. And so I felt like I was just constantly at war trying to prove that I was actually in this situation. And um, I really didn't start to know how bad it was until now, 18 months out. And I'm, you know, I don't, the silence scares me. Um, it's such a relief not to have to stick up for myself 24 seven. I didn't realize how exhausting it was until like you get put in a situation where you feel like you have to again, but like the constant like sticking up for yourself or worrying about what's gonna cause someone to snap or like enjoying your space and your alone time, just being you. Like, I didn't realize how time consuming this man was until now that he's gone, you know? And um, yeah, so <laughs> that's that. 
Um, but I do need more counseling and I'm glad you guys spoke upon it. Um, I did get some help, but like now it's like the other things that the constantly feel like everything's my fault. I deal with, um, the constant eggshells. I still deal with feeling like, you know, everyone's mad at me or, you know, there's something wrong with me all the time and it's, ex that's exhausting. So I feel like I'm going to definitely work on that. Yeah. Well, Nikki, I know when we met last year, because I always do a special episode um, every October on the podcast. So this is my fourth, fifth year. Um, so no matter what the theme is of my podcast, I always do this episode. And I remember last year um, you were going to do it. And then you said you couldn't do it. And you were letting me know what was going on. And I just, I prayed for you. And I was just like, when you're ready, I'm here. So I want to applaud you because you're here. You're alive. You are um, here to tell your story. You um, are recovering from not just addiction, but also abuse. Um, you look beautiful. You were beautiful then, but you're, you're beautiful. I can see your face, you're glowing. Um, it's a totally different person. Well, from the outside looking in, I know you probably don't feel like a totally different person, but your demeanor and the, what you're saying and the, the, the strength of what you're sharing is different from then. And so I want to applaud you for, um, the courage to get out of that relationship and even though it took for him to go to jail, sometimes we have angels that we don't even know are there. <laughs> <laughs> he got raided. We don't know why. Well, I, I, I haven't asked and you didn't share and that's okay. But he got raided and he went to jail and that gave you the space and opportunity for you to get yourself together and to get help. And you had an angel in the recovery place that was like, look, do you realize that the only time you come in here is after this happens with him and that's when you get back on drugs and you know, this is where you end up. So you had an angel there. And so you have people that love and care about you and that are there for you and continue to be there for you. And now you're there for yourself. Amen. And so I want to applaud you because I'm glad that you're able to share your story this year and um, that you're here to tell us about it. And I'm Thank so you. proud of you. I'm Thank very you. proud of you. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> trying to get through this episode without crying, but here we go. Here we go again. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just so proud of you. Um, you're just a beautiful person. And um, um, you've been through a lot. And to add addiction to it, but we also know that the addiction was occurring after and going through this abuse and you were probably self-medicating and that was your way of kind of getting away from reality of the situation. I, I don't want to say that that's what it was, but that's what it sounds like. Um, and um, I'm glad that now you, you freed yourself from that and that there was an angel that cared about you enough to say enough is enough, Nikki, like, do you realize the pattern? And they showed you the, the cycle of abuse and, and they, they helped you to understand that, it was not, you were going to die. And it sounded like he tried to kill you, poisoning, uh, choking, uh, all that. He he tried, he was going to kill you. And so I'm he, glad that you're here to tell he us. He actually um, sh hung his last girlfriend and she survived and he got it reduced down. Um, I didn't know that until, you know, it was too late, but he actually got it reduced down. And so... Yeah. How do you reduce attempted murder and hanging someone? Yeah, well, you don't have to answer that, but that's me just being like, what? He, he also got out a year later on a seven year sentence. So he's out right now. Yeah. So, oh, wow. you know, um, however, I'm, I have what I need in place. I got my restraining order. Um, I, my home is, you know, ready if someone were to come in here. Um, I have video cameras and I got amazing friends in my life that 
helped that happen and um, I have a lot of support and um, I, I'm surrounded by people that love me now. And so I don't, you know, as much as I try my best not to let it worry me, but I still have, you know, all the things that come with recovering. Yeah. And again, healing and the journey oh. after it stays with you. And that's not a negative thing. It's just continuously working on your mental health, continuously working on you, continuously keeping yourself safe. And that's okay because it's it's okay to, con to continue working on yourself. Even if you've never been in an abusive relationship, it's always good a good thing to continue working on yourself. Um, and so I, I just, I'm so happy that you are here to tell your story and you're not a statistic and that you're not one of those stories that we hear um, on the news about how Nikki Brooks was murdered by asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Yes. Um, so thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for coming on this year. Um, I have a feeling we're going to see more of you. You are in my um, Earn Your Wings cohort. Um, which is my coaching program that I launched in October, October 1st, yeah, that you are a part of, Tiffany's a part of, um, Davina is a part of, um, and it's to help support y'all to become advocates and, and regularly sharing your story to inspire others to share their story. So I'm, I'm so very proud of you and you. Um, taking the steps needed to protect yourself. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> I Thank really you. am. I'm truly proud of you. Um, so um, <laughs> I wanted to uh, bring on one of our guests. Um, she's not specifically sharing a story of, of, of surviving, but she wanted to be here to support everybody. So my sister, um, Reese, um, she is uh, um, very active in um, the Alter Ego Project, which is a professional networking group, initially for women, but it's for everyone now. Um, and she's always very supportive um, of me, of others that are on this platform that know her, such as Davina um, and Ro. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that y'all knew that she was here to support y'all. So Reese, if you can introduce yourself um, briefly, and then we will listen to Ms. Davina. <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Reese and I am here to support everybody. And I'm so grateful that you all are telling your stories because um, I feel like a long time ago, a lot of people didn't speak up and you know, that's why they kind of still were going through what they were going through. And I think it helps other people to hear your stories. Yes, 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 ma'am, it does. I, I don't know about anyone else. I know Alicia can probably attest to this because she's a, a regular advocate in the community that every time I've shared my story, which is going on seven years now, at least one person, and I'm just, I'm giving you the minimal, at least one person that's listening in the audience has come up to me and said, thank you for sharing. It, it helped. So I promise you there are people on right now and Nikki, I have Miss Barbara who's saying, I love you bunches, Nikki Brooks. I have, uh oh, did we miss, did we lose her? Oh no, she's there. Okay. So um, Miss Roxanne is saying, um, we all love you so much, Nikki. So very proud of you. Um, we've had multiple people who have said, thank you so much for sharing your stories to everyone who shared so far. Um, we had someone on here say, I cannot believe the stories that y'all have survived. I'm sorry. Um, I'm so grateful for y'all sharing your stories. So just know that your stories are affecting people even tonight. Um, so I'm very grateful for all of you, um, for sharing your stories. So thank you for those that are listening. Um, we are going over our time, but that's not going to stop us. Nikki's going to share a poem with us later. Um, and we have one more speaker. Wait, let me make sure. Yes, I think we have one more speak. No, two more. So, Miss Davina, are you ready? Can you hear me? Ready? Can y'all hear me good this time? Yes, we can hear you this time. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Okay, you got me crying already now. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry, I'm a big crybaby. <laughs> Yes, okay. ma'am. Um, so, um, I was telling the story about my daughter because it's kind of how it's, it, it, it was. He couldn't breathe and he gave her CPR. So I kind of felt like indebted to him for bringing her back. So, uh, like, the first time he hit me was like a month after that. And he didn't really do it in front of people. So a lot of people didn't know. He would do it like at night when we had the bed. And he used to punch me in my face. And, he had a um, he, he had a soft. He put, used to put batteries in and beat me in my back, and you know it was it was like you know like just he was an alcoholic. <laughs> um, um, he used to you know pull my hair, you know smack me and stuff like that. Um, and, and when I met him, I was a size fourteen, so I used food. Once I started getting beat, I used food to medicate. So. I, when that started, it was like 1993, and I still actually got married to him, believe it or not, in 1995. So how drastic it was, my weight gain, I met him in 93. I was a size 14. By the time I got married, my wedding dress was a size 22. <laughs> Even though I was still pretty, but it's just, and it, it, just, it just went on for years. My mother never knew. I never told. It was like you see movies on Lifetime and stuff like that, where people, you know, wear sunglasses at night and you know sitting. In the, I never thought I would end up. I never thought that would be me, <laughs> but it, you know it was. Um, he even you know we fought a few times in front of his family, but everybody thought it was funny, like you know his mother and, and people like that. Um, they never really did it in front of you know in front of my my oldest two kids. Um, it went on. It went on for years until the, the last, well, yeah, the last straw for me was uh, a month after I had my third son, his, his son. Um, he was about a month and a half, and he was in the bassinet. And this was back when you had the pagers that had the um, the messages, and you could put the pen, you know, check the messages. <laughs> And check it and everything. So you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a savvy. I'm a tech savvy, and I had his uh, passcode. And I heard a message from a woman. Um, and I'm just like, he having nerve to be talking to talking to you know talking to people after everything I'm going through. He even had a beer, an open beer can inside his cup when we got married. That's how bad of an alcoholic he was. <laughs> it's called Country Club. I don't even know if they still sell it. Um, but anyway, um. And I asked him about the message that I heard. And he hit me so hard on one side of my face <laughs> that my my other ear started ringing. And I don't know if if you remember the movie Why Did I Get Married Too where Janet Jackson lost it <laughs> when he when he broke the picture, when he burnt the picture of the baby. And she was like, Okay. <laughs> when he hit me that time, I was like, that was my okay moment. I put on my I put on my boots. I had um some Timberlands. I put on my boots, and he was on the bed, and I, I kicked him. I kicked him in the face, and we fought, and we fought, we fought around my son. Um, we used everything. I threw the microwave at him. Uh, he tried to choke me with a phone cord. He tried to throw gasoline on me. Um, we fought so bad in that house. <laughs> um, he ran to the bathroom. I kicked the bathroom door in. I took the shower, the shower rod off the shower, and I tried to, I was physically trying to stick it through him so I could pick him up with it. Because I was tired. All I could see was red. I was tired. And my aunt came downstairs because she lived on the second floor. She got me off of him, and he ran up to his sister's house, and I followed him up to his sister's house. I was hot. I was tired. Well, I was done. I was done. I was tired. But my son was still asleep. My son was the only thing left left standing in my house after after that. He, we, we didn't knock him over or anything. Um, I chased him. I walked up to his sister's house. I kicked her door in. I kicked his face in. Up to the day he passed away, he got he had a mark right here where I kicked his glasses in, and they stuck in his face. I was tired. And I, threw, I, I, I said, who else? Who else? Who else? Because y'all watched this for years. Y'all watched, y'all watched this fight for years. I thought it was funny. And I kept so much stuff from my brothers, my friends, my family. 
family. That nobody know what, what I went through. Nobody know what I went through. And you know, just just nights and nights and nights of abuse. You know, it would hit me and then pour you know, pour the beer on it. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, open my open my open my skin and pour the beer on it. Even even the wet night, even our wet night, you know, I got beat up on my wet night. And it, it, it was just crazy and I just got tired of it. But that was years ago, but it's so sexy because I can't get the weight off. I got the weight and I can't get it off. Where are you in the last I never got therapy. And that's probably one of the things that's wrong with me today because I need to get back to the older me. <laughs> I really do. Um, because my weight is, is causing health problems now. But I have to, I just, my weight is up and down, and I just wanted to go away. I just, you know, it's like it's still affecting me all this time, all these over 20 years later. And I, I can't get it off. It's just, it was easy to get on and hard to get off. And I'm tired now. So thank you for letting me tell my foot. Um, hold on Tiffany hold on Tiffany before you say stuff and I'm sitting outside so y'all can't see me anyway but I want you to know Davina like I'm sitting here listening to your story and it hurt me for number one because I know in the black community it's it's really fucked up how you can see your your family members sitting there getting beat and nobody does nothing or they think that it's normal or they laugh at you and don't realize that it could be the last time that they see you because they don't know what you got to go home and go through. It is not okay. Like in our community, they think that the more you argue, the better, the, the harder the love is. And that's not how it is. And then the second thing is, like you're talking about your weight. I was 252 pounds. And I lost the weight. And even me losing the weight, I st I suffer from body dysmorphism because I always look in the mirror and no matter how much weight I lose, I always see that girl that's 252 pounds, even to this day. Like, you know what I'm saying? I put on clothes and stuff and nothing ever looks right to me. I always look in the mirror and say that I'm real fat. And that's because my abusers, they planted that in my head for years that I was fat, nobody was going to want me, not even them. I would put on lingerie, trying to be sexy, and they would laugh in my face like, you know what I'm saying, like it was nothing. And so I get it when you say that, you know what I'm saying, the weight bothers you. Even though I've lost my weight, I'm still carrying mine around mentally. And people don't understand how fucked up that is. And even though people don't see me like that, they see me like, you know, they see me as a different person. Don't realize that the person I see in the mirror is not the same person that they see. Yep. So I'm just letting you know that if you want to lose weight, like you can do something about it. But even after you lose the weight, you still got to change your mental behind it. And know that no matter if you're skinny or fat, you still beautiful. You still are worth something. Yes. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ro, because you you probably said everything I was going to say and more. Um, Davina, you are beautiful in so many ways. Your weight does not determine your beauty. And I want you to know that you do have a village. I need to get my butt out here and go walking. I need to. I need to exercise. So knowing that that is a goal of yours, we need to get it together. And and I'm willing. I live out here in Egypt, but I'm willing to meet you if you want to go walk in, if you want to go to the gym, if you want to. Um, we got, what is it? Uh, Reese's sister, Sherelle, she does meal, mm -hmm. meal prep and meal stuff yeah. to help you. She mm -hmm. helped Miss Judith Brown um, lose weight. I know that she can help you too. Whatever support mm -hmm. you need love we are right here we will try our best to support you um but i, I want to i like to point out patterns all of us have something residual after whether it's weight whether it's a negative self image whether it's aggression whether it's you know depression ptsd we all have something 
So don't feel like you're by yourself. We all have something that we continue to work on. And like Rose said, you can get the weight off. It does take time. It is easier to get that. It's so easy to get that weight on. Trust. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to get it off, but you can. And just know that you have people that are here to support you in whatever capacity, even if it's just a virtual, hey, girl, how you doing? What you eating this week? Can we suggest this? Can we suggest that? And I definitely highly recommend reaching out to Sherelle because I've seen her helping Miss Judith. Um, mm -hmm. And I see, I saw Miss Judith last Sunday at Cloud Check and the girlfriend looked good. You hear me? So you know Sherelle, reach out to her. I know that she can help you. Um, mm -hmm. I know that it works because I saw Miss uh, Judith last week and I was like, whoa, right? So yeah. I know I know she can help you. Um, I'm, I'm gonna be honest, I can be lazy when it comes to working out. But if I know that I'm supporting somebody that they call an accountability partner, I can, mm -hmm. I can help you and you can help me because I know I need to do it myself. I got to I got to get yeah. rid of, get rid of these wings, girl. So yeah. <laughs> I offer I offer up to to be a part of this. So maybe we okay. can start a group for yes. all of us to be accountability sisters or something. I love um, it. Okay. I have an idea as far as like um I'll I'll take that conversation offline so we don't take up too much time okay. on here. But I'll definitely yeah. reach out to you, Miss Davina, and we can we can okay. definitely get something going. I love okay, it. Good. I love it. Thank You've got to you. support, girl. You've got to support, girl. And we love you. We love you. There's no reason why I should have to keep using a walker <laughs> to walk around. It's, it's, it's painful. So it's okay. I do I've lost 100 pounds. I know Nikki has had um, weight loss as well, and I still have to use my cane. So don't see it as, girl, my cane has a, has a name. This is Butterfly, okay? <laughs> I lost 100 pounds. I still use my cane because I know I need it. Don't be ashamed of what you need, okay? Don't ever be ashamed of what you need. You know, um, let me dress up my, my, uh, my cane, my dad's cane. I got it. I took it after he passed. So I got, I'm on a um, baby spray paint or something. I remember you telling me that. So see, you've got your dad with you, walking with you. <laughs> I remember you telling me that. That's so special. Um, okay, one more speaker, and then we're going to hear our poems and then we're going to go ahead and close out. So Miss Alicia, Miss Coach Lee, um, we've been friends for a long time. I, I love her. She's moved away from me. She then left me and went to Louisiana. But I love her. She, she comes on uh, my podcast several times to talk about self-love and loving yourself and loving yourself back to healing. Um, so Miss Coach, Coach Lee, please um, share your story. I know we're over everything. Thank Hello. you for staying on. Go ahead, Ms. Coach. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Good evening. And as I'm sitting here, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, my heart is so heavy for everyone. And just know that eventually it gets better. It, it, it does get better. And I have been through so many multiple abusive relationships. And the one that kept sticking out for me to share, I don't even know if I ever shared this one, but it was my first one where it was physical abuse. And to start off, I grew up in an abusive home. I witnessed my mom be abused. I witnessed my aunt be abused. So to me, that was normal. That abuse was normal. So if I was in a regular relationship, a regular relationship, without <laughs> any yelling, with anybody saying anything mean to me, calling me out my name, or physically doing to me, I thought something was wrong with them. And I say all this because growing up, if you accustomed to that life, that's what you know, that's what it is. That's what you're experiencing love is. If no one else told you this is abuse, that's unhealthy, that's not love. So with the one I'm going to share is I remember, oh my gosh, my sister had to be around about 10 years old and me and him was arguing and of course he was calling me all kinds of names and we was fighting and my sister tried to jump in and it was like, leave my sister alone. And he actually pushed her and put his hands on my sister and that just made me flip out. And I'm like, don't do that. And I flipped out on him in the midst of me flipping out on him. He grabbed me by my neck, slung me on a counter and at the where my apartment was set up, the edge of the counter was the wall. 
So it hit the right side of my face. And next thing I know, it was just blood dripping from my face. And when he seen I was bleeding, he fled. He ran. And my sister called the police. And I got out. I was like, oh, my gosh, my eye bleed, my eye bleeding. Police came in the ambulance came and I wound up being in the hospital with a fractured eye socket so I had to stay in the hospital for a while and with that at the time my dad still was living and he was like um where this guy at I'm gonna do this I'm gonna do that and I'm thinking to myself but I watch you do all this to my mom so what's wrong what's the problem what did he do that was so wrong even though I'm in a hospital with this you know, right side of my eye patched up and what did he do that was so wrong? And no, I did not go back with that relationship. I got it wrong. I'm getting a restraining order and all of this stuff, but it, that didn't stop me from going into another abusive relationship because I didn't heal from it. I jumped from one relationship to the next. And during that, it got to the point where I lost my voice. I didn't speak up for myself and I was always a boisterous person like oh you can't tell me what to do I'm gonna do this I'm gonna do that and I lost my voice and then from another relationship from me losing my voice when I finally gained it back it caused me to be controlling in a relationship that wasn't abusive but I was the controller one and I felt like since my Control I took since somebody wanted to treat me this way. I'm gonna, I got control now. And I was really being the one that was mentally and emotionally abusive, telling them, You ain't this, you ain't that, you ain't gonna do nothing because you this. And I had to realize that that was not me. I didn't like how it made me feel, but I felt like I was protecting me. I felt like I had to protect myself because I was so torn and so ripped away. And I went from one unhealthy relationship to the next. And I'm, I'm cutting it short with my story because of time, y'all. But it's like I had experience being held by gunpoint. I've been experienced by getting hit in the nose with a gun with a fraction, my nose being broke. I experienced being held in a room, you not leaving out. And by me being an advocate out in the community, that is a form of abuse. When you have an argument with someone and they saying you cannot leave out the room, that is kidnapping. So now they hold you as a kidnapper, especially if they keeping you in a room for so long. Now you kidnapping me. And a lot of people don't look at that as being kidnapped. It's like, well, let me just have this conversation with you. Let me just finish this argument. They cannot, they don't suppose to hold you captive in a room like that. And I didn't even realize that was abuse when I was experiencing it. And I used to cover up and lie just to make the person, he's not that bad. He's this, he's that, he's going through something, making excuses. And, oh, how did you get that black eye? What happened to your eye? Well, I got hit in the face with a football or the dog bit me. The dog bit me. I had so many excuses because I was embarrassed. Because I felt shameful because I just felt like no one would understand what I was going through. No one wouldn't believe me. No one wouldn't this, no one wouldn't that. I was making up so many excuses because they do put you in isolation. They isolate you from all your family, your friends, and just listen to everybody's story. It's like they make you believe no one don't care about you. I'm the only one that's here for you. I'm the only one that's going to do this and that for you. When in reality, they break you all the way down so that you are left alone with them and it's like I'm being left alone and then I got to the point where I became suicidal I just I just didn't want to live I wanted to kill myself so many times I even used to pray Jesus please just take me out of here I'm I'm, I'm ready to go my kids will be okay because they better off without me being here and that was heavy too I remember one time my kids went to go stay with their dad. I don't even think I ever publicly shared this. My kids went to go stay with their dad for a weekend. And I called and said, tell my babies I love them. He's like, what's going on? I was like, just tell them I love them. And I took some pills because I did not want to wake up the next day. I felt like me not being here was going to be better for them 
because of what I was going through. I was already mentally gone. I felt physically drained. I just couldn't do it no more. I couldn't hold it together no more. And I just was like, the, the best thing for me to do is be gone. It wasn't meant for me to be gone because I'm still here. And it got to a point where one day my daughter told me, I, well, before she told me this, I said to her, to my daughters, don't ever let somebody talk to you any kind of way. Don't ever let nobody treat you horribly. Always stand up and speak up for yourself. Be strong for yourself. And when my baby looked at me and said, well, mommy, why are you letting somebody do that to you? I knew then I had to make a stand for myself. I had to stand up for myself. I, I knew then that I had to get better because regardless of what I'm telling them, it's the behavior that they see and they witness. And just like I witnessed my mom and my aunt, even though they didn't tell me, don't, don't let nobody do this, don't do that. But it's like the behavior from me witnessing it is what's stuck. And I had, I had to learn that in order for my children to believe what I say, I have to be an example. I had to be an example. And by then the police knew me by name. They came to the house so many times. So it's like, I got therapy. I started going, getting a coach. I had to fall deep into Alicia. I had to learn who Alicia was because I didn't know who I was. I was gone. I was lost. And once I found who I am, who I was at that time, it's like, wow, this is, this is me. This is who I am. I had to learn how to love me. I had to learn how to know what I like because I was so, so much pleasing this other, other people to make sure as long as I'm pleasing them, they won't do this. As long as I'm constantly doing that, they'd be okay. We won't argue, we won't fight. No matter how much you try to please that individual, that's not going to change them. They're going to still have these, oh, you doing this. You got to be dealing with that person. You got to be having sex with this person. Oh, you don't care about me. You don't love me. It's like they always blame you for whatever happening. Look what you made me do. Because of you, I had to do this. And once you start really diving deep into yourself and getting that therapy, seeking that coach, having that support system around you, you're going to know that you're worthy. You're going to learn that you are enough. You're going to learn that life is so much more than being let down, put down, beat down. And I was the person that covered stuff up too and buried everything under the rug. I didn't want nobody to know what stays in this house is our business. Don't tell nobody. Tell everybody. Don't, don't be the one that say what happens in this house stays in this house. That's the problem now in a lot of the communities. We want to bury stuff. We want to keep stuff a secret. And then when something happens, it's like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know that person was like that. Speak up for yourself. Don't feel like I'm going to be embarrassed. Nobody ain't going to listen. Everybody is going to listen. It's a big community out here. We out here to educate. We out here to support. We out here to make sure that you are going to be the one to survive and share your story and be able to speak up and help and assist others. And that's how I became a self-love coach because I had to dive deeper into myself, learn how to love me again, learn all about me. And once I found who I was and learn how to love me wholeheartedly, I said, it's no way I can keep this to myself. It's no way. I have to teach others how to love themselves. I had to teach others how to overcome the trauma. I had to teach others how to build healthy relationships, starting with a healthy relationship within themselves so that they can start attracting healthy, true, healthy relationships with others. And by me doing it, and this is not for the adults, it's also for the youth, going into the schools and CMS schools and in the community and letting them know that this is unhealthy. When a partner do X, Y, and Z and do all of that, that's unhealthy. That's not a healthy relationship. Since I never was educated on it, since I never knew what this difference between a healthy and unhealthy relationship was, I, like I said, I grew up in a household, so that was my norm, but the norm was unhealthy. So to finish off, I just want everyone to know that you are worthy, you are enough, you are loved, and you have that support.
Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Alicia. And I, everybody, and I'm, I'm all into patterns because I think it's really important, especially in a platform like this, is to see those patterns that everyone had that point where they were just like, enough is enough. And some, some of you that are watching might still be in your situation. And we hope that by listening to what we're saying and what we're sharing, that you don't wait till that moment where you're getting hit upside your head choked, stabbed, cussed out, your children are getting hurt, that you, you, you are realizing that this is not right. These people can get out. They're alive to tell it. I can get out too. I'm hoping that's what's resonating with, if anyone, if you're out there in an abusive relationship right now, whether it's physical, mental, emotional, whatever form, no form is okay. Not One form is not worse than the other. Just because you're not getting hit doesn't mean that the emotional abuse that you're dealing with on a daily basis is any less traumatic. So for me, words last longer than the bruise. For some people, the physical is the worst, and I understand that. Like Nikki, I can't, I can't, and I can't even imagine someone choking me with a telephone cord or poisoning me. So that might be the worst for you. For some, someone else hearing you being called a bitch and a slut and a whore and all that kind of stuff every day might be the worst. It's whatever is the worst for you, no matter what form, n none of it is okay. And not one is worse than the other. All of it is wrong. And you deserve to love yourself enough to get out of that and love yourself and your children enough to get out of that. So I just want to and encourage others to also find out the different styles of abuse because yes. a lot of us, um, we always talk about like the physical abuse or the emotional abuse, but nobody ever talks about like, you know, like you were saying before, the financial abuse where you're not allowed to work so they control all the money mm -hmm. or they only give you money if you're doing good or, mm -hmm. you know, different scenarios. There's also, like you said, spiritual abuse. You know, mm -hmm. most for most of us, our how power is what keeps us grounded and, you know, sane. So they'll keep you from going to, you know, mosque church. or you know mm -hmm. the temple or you know church or whatever just so you won't have that peace or that grounding it's a lot of different things that are that we don't consider abuse because like you like she was saying um Elisa was saying that it's it's normal and mm -hmm. I know like I don't I can't speak for my um Caucasian counterparts over here but I know in the black community like no, it's seriously, it's terrible because like she was saying, we were brought up that whatever goes on in this house stays in this house. You don't talk about, you know, things that go on to a nobody. You know, you see your auntie get smacked by, you know, your uncle or your mom or dad. And we like, oh, well, they just arguing again. And it's normal for us until, you know, we get in those situations and then we see that, hey, this ain't right. And right. then sometimes like I got a cousin, she didn't believe her man loved her unless he was beating her because that's how they were shown affection and love in their household. Like her mom and dad would always fight. So she felt like a man didn't love her unless he put his hands on. So, you know, it's different forms. So if you don't know, get with somebody, educate yourself on the different types of abuse. And just because it is abuse doesn't mean that it can't be corrected because sometimes people don't know and what you don't know, you can't correct. So it may be just as simple as them getting help and counseling just like you. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's not my that's my two cents. That that was that was a whole 50 cent. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I want to add something if I can to I think um a lot of people that have been through abuse, including myself, you get to a point to where you almost don't feel loved if you don't get get it. It's like if if the person is not that into you that they're willing to go all in and and be that dramatic about it, then it almost doesn't like when when you find a healthy relationship, it seems lackluster. It seems like, well, do, do they really even love me? I mean, they're, they're mm -hmm. not even willing to like fight with me and you know all that. So it it takes time to learn how to be in a healthy relationship and how it 
it is enough and it's actually more if you accept it but you're so used to another way that it doesn't feel like they're putting enough effort in if they're not doing that right very good point i i know i grew up in a home that it was abusive um and I, I don't like sharing these things because I, 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 my concern is for my family and my, my mom, but my, my dad was abusive mentally, emotionally. He was a serial cheater. That's all I saw in my home. Um, they would get into fights. Um, I saw that I was molested by a family friend. So, you know, I saw all these things as a child. And so when you get older and you're like, all the people that I thought loved me or, or knew loved me or whatever you thought, you know, people that were supposed to be there to protect you and love you, hurt you. And so now your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, your wife, you know, anybody, that's what you expect. And, and Barry's right. You have to learn what you have to be retrained to understand that healthy relationships doesn't include abuse, being hit, being smack, being punched, being kicked, being demeaned, you know, all those things. You have to learn that and you have to learn it because you were taught that that's what it was, what it was. And then you figure out eventually, hopefully without losing your life that, you know what, no, this is not right. And unfortunately, sometimes as mothers, we have to also train our children that what you saw and what you witnessed in me or with grandma or with whatever, those are not healthy relationships. Now you have to retrain. So you have to, you have to, you, you, you have to, and it's a hard cycle to get out of, but it's a cycle that you can break. Every, every circle can be broken. Every cycle can be, can be, you know, redirected. So you don't have to continue those cycles. So thank you for bringing that point. Um, I've, I've, I've met, um, victims and then found out weeks later that they were killed because they went back. So um, our last, uh, um, our last- uh, Before you go to the last question, mm -hmm. real quick. So I just wanted to add this, that it is so important that we are constantly looking to be educated, constantly. Even if you're still in the situation, Google search some stuff. Google search, constantly be in the space where you're educating yourself on what is this? Okay, I'm, I'm experiencing this in my relationship. So let me Google, what is this? Let me find out more information about it. And even if you Google in healthy and unhealthy relationships and you doing it in the privacy of your own home, because it's like the more you educate yourself, the more knowledgeable you are being on it. And the more you like, this is not acceptable. And I'm just... And even educating our youth, our children, because when they witness us going through it, if they're not educated properly on it, the cycle repeats itself. And it's time to break them generational habits and start some new ones. That's all I want to add. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. The last thing we want is for our children to witness the shit they were going through. And then they get into an abusive relationship and you're trying to tell them to get out of that relationship that you're still in we don't want to be hypocritical as parents Mo mothers mothers or fathers we, we want our children to be safe and we want what's best for them and i i've found myself saying to my kids and i'm i'm i can say this don't don't pull up with the crap that i've put up with and i've had my daughter because my daughter is very blunt like her mama <laughs> and we're working on it both of us are <laughs> but she didn't say but you're doing it or you did it and my, my daughter loves me to pieces. Like I'm her world. And I had to say, you know what? You're right. I've had to learn from my daughter when she's like, uh-uh, I ain't dealing with this, you know? And I've had to say, I applaud you, my daughter, who's 15, for not putting up with that from whatever boy she likes or whatever. Even her friends, if they act a certain way with her abusively, mentally, emotionally, she checks them and she cuts them off. And I would like to say that I have something to do with that, but I know that's because she's strong and she's seen her mama go through some things. And she's been and have heard my story. She's been to all of these events where people are talking about their stories. So I would hope that it's really her 
who has educated herself and she's taken it all in to know what to accept and not what to accept, even if sometimes her mama accepts stuff. And I'm still working on it. We're all a work in progress. But I've also heard how our children, they saw stuff that we didn't see when we were in it. And they, they said, well, you're doing it. And so sometimes our children can be our saving grace. Sometimes our children can be our angels. So, um, Miss Brittany, you have been so, so patient. You've been so patient, but your story is one that we need to hear. So Miss Brittany, please share. And she's going to be our, our last, um, our last uh, speaker tonight. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to the poems, but I, I think that's with good reason. We've had a lot to talk about. So, Miss Brittany. Hey, everybody. It's been such a pleasure just to listen to you guys. I'm over here holding back tears the whole time, but it's just been such a valuable conversation. So I just want to thank everybody for sharing their stories tonight. My name is Brittany Bell. So I'm 23 years old. I've actually been through relationship violence, and I also lost a friend due to domestic violence last year. And so I'm gonna go, I'm not gonna go too deep because I know we're short for time, but I am gonna talk a little bit about my relationship violence and my life. So I actually grew Brittany, up very Hello. quickly. Don't feel that you need to shorten your story. Those that want to hear it will will stay on and hear it. And we're here to support you, okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so I grew up in a culture of violence as well. I heard that, you know, similar stories tonight. And it was mostly my dad, he was um, a big cheater. And I saw my mom and dad, they were both like abusive to each other. And I didn't really think much of it because it was like a culture in my family. Like my uncle beat my aunt and, you know, we, we seen different things. Me and my sisters, we seen different things um, that were abusive, like mental abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse. And it was also like what goes in the house stays in the house. It was that type of situation always growing up. And when I was 17, I actually um, was a part of an abusive situation from my uncle. Uh, we got into a physical fight. But of course, me being 17, I could, I mean, I'm a, I'm, I'm a young woman at this time. I can't really do much. But it was something that tore me to pieces. And at that point in my life, I just felt like I just wanted to be loved by somebody. I did grow up in the church, but I felt like once I got, once I became a teenager and then like becoming a young woman, I'm like, I don't know my relationship with God at this point. Like, I'm just still trying to figure myself out. So I started dating this one guy when I was 18 and really I was just in it to have fun. He had a car and I could go any place I want. You know, I could go, if I'm mad at my family, I can leave them. I can go do my own thing. And it was fun. You know, we got to do, we had to do our little drugs and, you know, have sex, whatever. But then it started to get really toxic with him. And actually it was his family. His family was more toxic to me than him. So his dad, and specifically, he would make fun of me being a Christian. Like, he would be like, oh, your God is fake. And he would be like, you're just so dumb. And like, he was emotionally abusive to me, his dad. And I took it as also emotionally abusive from the guy, too, that I was dating. Because he would never protect me. He would laugh at the, at the jokes. And he would always just, like, not say anything, like, not defend me. And one time, he hit me. Uh, we... He, excuse me, I actually, I actually got into an altercation with my family and I left to go with him. And his family was also there because it was a big storm that was going on. It was like a really big storm and it was flooding and everything. So I couldn't really leave. And it seemed like he was just like trying to start something with me to like make like jokes and stuff because his family was there. And like we, like he started hitting me and then I hit him back, but then he's like hitting me really hard. And I'm just like, I told him to stop. He kept hitting me. I'm like, okay, I have to leave him. So I did leave him after that. But it was it seemed like I still needed to find myself because I was still dating the same type of man, even though it wasn't the same person. Like, I remember the next time I started dating someone, this person I actually knew for, like, over seven years, but it had been, like, an online friendship that we met in person. And, like, he seemed like the guy of my dreams. And we actually moved in together. And... He was fine for two weeks. And then after that, like, after those two weeks, it's like he got too comfortable and he and I started to see the real him. He was basically spiritually abusive. Like, I would be praying or something and he would just be, like, trying to take my faith away from me. And at that point, I was trying to develop my relationship with God. 
know, as a Christian, because I'm like, I did grow up in the church and I still want to hang on to my faith. And then he would be like, yeah, your God is dumb. Like, I, why do you listen to the Bible? And he was trying to make me watch all these crazy videos about horoscopes. And I don't knock anybody that do horoscopes, but he was literally making me watch these videos. Like, you need to watch this, educate yourself. Um, he would just like make me feel like I wasn't enough. For example, he would just be like, yeah, you can't hear your dumb. You need to go get your ears checked out. Like all these things he would say about me. And I finally like let him go. Cause I'm like, you know what? You got to leave. You know, he didn't sign a lease. Thank God. But I'm like, you have to leave because it was just like on my birthday. Actually, he didn't say happy birthday. He didn't get me nothing. And he was starting stuff on my birthday. And I, I felt like, okay, God, like if you want him to leave, just like let it, let it be done. And like the next day he actually packed his bag. I didn't even tell him he had to leave, but I was just thinking like, yeah, he got to go because he was just really toxic and I could feel his energy. Like he didn't want me to even have faith in God, like for myself. Like, I don't feel like anybody has that right to do that. So after that, um, I actually was in college during like this whole time and I, I stopped dating for a while. And then I did start dating another person. And my friend, she introduced me to her brother but it turns out her brother was the worst of them all because he lied to me like he was married to somebody and she knew he was married and she put me with him because apparently they were separated. So I was like his fling or whatever, but I didn't, I didn't know. And when I didn't know, it was kind of like, it wasn't too late, but I was already having soul ties with him and it was kind of hard to break off. But he was also very angry. He would yell, he would, he would get upset over small things. And like, I would always have this pit in my stomach, like this, this empty feeling. I don't know if any of you guys ever felt it, but I would want to be with him. But then whenever I would be with him, I would feel so empty and alone. And I was just, it's like, we were only connected through our traumas. And so we, it's, we, it's like, we had a trauma bond. He never hit me ever, but he was just like, when he got angry, like, I didn't know what was going to happen. Like he just was yelling and like the fact that he always lied for like a lot of stuff and he never showed up for any of my things, but I always was there for him. It was just like, it was not adding up to me. And then my friend in the middle of that, that situation, it wasn't even a committed relationship. My friend lost her life due to domestic violence. And it's crazy because in high school, while I was like having my first relationship, whatever, she was with her abuser for four years, I wanna say. She was 21 when she passed away and he was, he was being on her day and, and my sister was more closer to her than me. And she, well, you know, she and her other closer friends were like, girl, like you gotta leave him, you know? And she was like, I know. And she was actually trying to leave him, you know, several times. And the last time she actually did leave and she got her own place and everything. And she was going outside in her car and I, I don't even know where she was going, but she was in her car. And he came and he shot her in her head while she was in her car. And when I heard about that situation, that was the last straw. That was, it was like, okay, because now my friend lost her life. So it's like, it's not even about me anymore. It's about me sharing her story and finding out how I can be an advocate, how I can share our stories together. Because like that broke me down because I was only hit like one time from someone, but the emotional abuse and the mental abuse, it adds up to that physical abuse. And um, when she passed away, she left behind four kids and she had just had a two week old baby. So that broke me down. Like she wasn't like my best friend, but whenever I see her, she was like, you know, you have those friends that she like, you love so much. Like, even if you don't talk every day, that's what she was like. And when I heard about that, like I was, it just broke me down. It broke me down so much. So I had to like detach from that situation. Like I just stopped talking to him and then he would call me. I wouldn't answer. And then one time he had called me and I was just like, I'm done. Like we're done. You know, so I had just detached and like for a whole year, like I wasn't dating or anything. Like I'm just like, it's just time for me to love myself and heal, you know, so. I had started looking at the poems because like while I was going through that, I was writing poems and I just started looking at all the poems and stuff that I was writing. And I was like, you know, I'm going to publish this because now like my friend lost her life. She can't tell her story and she tried to leave, you know, she, <laughs> and she did. And, you know, she's not able to tell her story. And, um, you know, she has four kids. Like her, her son is now one this year and she has all her kids under six.
So I'm like, I have to publish this and like share this story, like share her story and share my story. And like also give um, us as survivors a platform, you know, because most of the time we don't talk about it unless it's like domestic violence awareness month, but it should be talked about all the time because every single day some people are dying some people are going through this silently. They want to kill themselves and stuff. And I've, I've been there too, you know, and those thoughts do come up. But now, like, my faith is stronger than ever. Like, even though sometimes I feel sad or whatever, I'm like, you know, I speak to my soul. I'm like, you overcame. You have to keep going. You know, you have to stay strong, you know. And, like, I just always remember my friend. Like, she can't she can't say anything. So I have to speak for her. It's, and, and all of us are blessed to be alive because some people can't speak. So I, I wrote my book, Tales of a Wildflower. It's, it's a collection of poetry that I was writing while I went through the emotional abuse the, and uh, physical abuse and all the traumas that I've been through. And I realized, like, as I got older, it stemmed from when I was a kid, that cultural, that, that cultural violence in my family that was never addressed. You know, and I, I promised myself when I have kids, I'm going to affirm them. And, and right now I'm a kindergarten teacher. I teach kindergarten. And every morning those kids come in, they look in the mirror. And you have to say something kind to yourself. You have to say you're beautiful. You have to say you're strong. And even if you don't believe it, you're going to start to believe it. The more you look in the mirror and tell yourself, because for a long time, I, I heard his voice. where he said, oh, you can't hear you're dumb, you know, ridiculing me. You look like a man. You got all these broad shoulders and stuff like that. And then, you know, I had to say, you know what? He wanted to break me down because he never wanted me to use my voice. But now I always speak everywhere I go. I tell my story. I pass out my cards. And I've been meeting so many survivors and people that have been telling their stories to me and what the enemy wants to use, you know, that my situation may not be as hard as other people's. But it doesn't matter what situation it is because we all of our stories are unique and we can all heal together. It doesn't matter if it was just one time or if it's been like all your life. Like every story and every single person has value. And it doesn't matter what story, what what they've been through, but it's about overcoming it and loving each other together, you know, and, and embracing each other and not like thinking, oh, she only went through this one time. So she don't know nothing about it because a lot of times we see that as kids, we see this cultural violence that grows and grows. And the next thing you know, we pass it on to our children. And I've seen that. I even heard my great grandma, she killed her, uh, her ex-husband. Well, he was, she was married to him. She killed her husband because he was abusive to her. So that, that was my great, great grandma. So it keeps passing, passing now. And I said, no, it's going to end with me. I wrote this poetry book and like, I've been, I haven't been in a, a toxic relationship since. And I told myself, I, when I have kids, I will speak to my kids. You are beautiful. Because that wasn't something I was taught as a kid. I wasn't taught to love myself, you know, and especially being abused by a man in my family that tore me down. Because I'm like, a man is supposed to protect and supposed to love. So when a man beats on you, especially someone close to you, like a family member, that brings you down, you know. So what I'll say to you guys, to you ladies, to encourage you is to look at yourself in the mirror and realize you are a victor. You're not a victim. And God has you for a specific purpose. You know, you have to have faith. You have to keep pushing, knowing that he kept you alive for a reason. You could have been in the headlines. And I actually witnessed a domestic violence situation uh, at an Airbnb. And I'm actually recovering from that because the girl that was there, he was beating on her while he was there. And he shot the gun. And I was there and I was like, yo, like, it was crazy. Like, the fact that I was even there in that situation. We had already talked about domestic violence early, me and the same girl. So I'm like, these things are happening. And sometimes we may be a witness of it. And if we are, we need to make sure we're standing strong with those people that are going through it and giving them options. And um, like, like other people saying, educating yourself and also showing grace to those who are still going through it because sometimes they're just trying to think about what would be best for them and just realizing whatever decision they make, that's what they think that's the best for them. So praying for people and also helping them if they need help. So you can get my book, Tells of Wildflower online excuse me, belleternitypublishing.com. Also, I'm on Instagram at Real Lit Brit. But that's just a little bit about my story and my healing process. I'm still healing every day, just like every single one of us. And I actually had gained 100 pounds during my, I had ate, I was eating a lot. I used eating and smoking weed as my 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 um, coping mechanisms. And I have, I've been sober for one year now from, from smoking weed. You know, that was my thing. Uh, I actually was introduced to it by uncle. So that was also a generational curse as well. But I was like, you know what? I need to get sober. I need to heal. 
and I need to take time just to love on myself. And since I've been sober, like it does hurt, you know, it hurts to heal. But those 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 pains that you heal, I mean, those yeah, those pains that you feel, it's really grow, growing pains, you know. So I'm embracing that pain, you know, and I'm just still healing from it every day. Thank you so much. It's, it is so amazing to hear someone as young as you with such a strong voice. And I'm so sorry that you lost your friend. I'm so proud of her for getting out of that relationship and knowing that it was time to go. And unfortunately, he still was able to take her from you. So I applaud you. I applaud her for recognizing abuse in whatever form that it comes. And I'm so proud of you for wanting to be a voice for her, for her children, for yourself, for others, especially at your age. And um, I think that we need more young ones to tell their story because there's so many. I, I've heard of my twins, they're 15, talk about their friends who have been hit by their boyfriends at 15 years old, that have been cursed out, smacked, pushed at 15 years old. So this is, their children are having, are in domestic violence relationships already, middle school, high school. So just imagine if no one steps in to help them or support them, or they don't know that they're in a, a abusive relationship, what what their their life will turn out to be. I had abuse in my home growing up. I know Alicia said she had abuse in her home growing up. Um, Davina said she had abuse growing up in her home. Brittany, you said you did. So it is a pattern. It's time to break that those patterns. And it starts with us speaking up and sharing our stories. I just want to share real quickly some statistics before we go, because I think it's important. And so I was saying earlier, I need to correct myself. So on average, nearly 20 people per minute are physically abused by an intimate partner. One in four women and one in nine men experience severe intimate partner violence. One in four women and one in seven men have been victims of severe physical violence. One in seven women and one in 18 men have been stalked by an intimate partner. On a typical day, there are more than 20,000 phone calls placed to domestic violence hotlines nationwide. The presence of a gun in a domestic violence situation increases the risk of homicide by 500%. I'm gonna say that again. For those that are listening, the presence of a gun in a domestic violence situation increases the risk of homicide by 500%. Intimate partner violence accounts for 15% of all violent crimes. Women between the ages of 20, 18 and 24, which is Brittany's bracket, are most commonly abused by an intimate partner. 19% of domestic violence involves a weapon. Domestic victimization is correlated with a higher rate of depression and suicidal behavior which a couple of you have revealed you have felt suicidal or were suicidal. Only 34% of people who are injured by intimate partners receive medical care for their injuries. And then the homicide statistics, a study of intimate partner homicides found that 20% of victims were not the intimate partners themselves, but family members, friends, neighbors, persons who intervene, law enforcement responders, or bystanders. 72% of all murder suicides involve an intimate partner. 94% of the victims these of these murder suicides are female. And then lastly, the number of domestic violence homicides statewide, this is North Carolina only where I live in 2022, total 47 deaths. That's North Carolina alone. Just imagine if we tell all 50 states, 47 deaths in 2022, North Carolina by itself. And according to domestic violence statistics, there are 16,800 homicides and $2.2 million worth of injuries due to the in intimate partner violence annually, which costs $37 billion. This is a problem. We're all here to reduce domestic violence cases and DV related homicides. If you are a victim and you need support, please reach out to any of us on here. Any of us will do what we can to support you. Any of us on here. I don't feel I have to ask. I feel that I can say it. Collectively, if you need help and you need support, reach out to anyone on here. Please do that. If you are a survivor and you are ready to share your story, please reach out to any of us on here. I just published my, bo my book, Earn Your, Earn Your Wings, A 30-Day Journey from Survivor to Advocate, Try coaching survivors to learn how to share their story, get better at sharing their story, be empowered to share their story, be motivated, and then inspiring others to share their story. 
you also have Miss Coach Lee. She helps you with loving yourself again. You have to love yourself. You have to love yourself to be able to get out of these abusive relationships. And then you have to continue loving yourself to stay healthy and to work on yourself, to love yourself, to know that you are worthy. And then you also have to educate yourself and educate others, including your children, your community, in any way, shape, or form, not just during October Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So thank you everybody for joining. Thank you for those who stayed on because we still do have people commenting. We went over, but it's okay. We had a lot to share. Thank you everyone for sharing your personal stories. They were very personal, very, very intimate. Thank you for sharing. We appreciate you and everyone have a good night and stay safe.